thank you guys all for taking time out of your schedules. Is that out? Are we, are we okay here? Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> uh, to come to the talk, hear a little about my research. Um, I'm certainly interested in your questions. But again, I just want to stress um, I appreciate the time that you take to come and do this. Um, I can tell that you guys value your program and uh, want it to be successful. Um, I'm, I'm excited about FSU, um, the investment in, a, in, in literacy, in other, in other fields besides just English education, but also um, in literacy broadly defined within English education, and, um, and also the way, the way faculty here have invested in, in research on technology-rich environments, and you'll see those interests played out in my talk a bit today. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in questions that, that this talk may evoke, um, so I'll just, I'll just dive in. The presentation today positions collaborative problem solving as a context for social, uh, social learning. Members of this service learning class in the picture have divided into affinity groups based on preference to discuss ideas that they're developing uh, for an anti-hunger action, service learning, so there's this outside of class component. Much of the first half of the semester is spent in roundtable discussions like this, large and small group. Um, sometimes these discussions happen online, by telephone, or informally. Uh, one part of the class is actually non-negotiable. Students are four flights up on top on the green roof of a geography building. Um, and so this is sort of the, the fishbowl of negotiation when they decide what to plant and why to plant and who might receive the fruits of their labors and how those things might be distributed. Uh, so this, this context is full of negotiation about how to, uh, what to do generally in the class and what to do very specifically. So back in the classroom, the students discuss what they're going to do. Back in the classroom, as the students discuss what they want to do, um, Terry says, food problems are bigger than just food. You can't separate food issues from broader socioeconomic problems. And seemingly in agreement, Chan responds, yes, big business is ruining our food system. And we all sit back and wonder, is Terry going to say, that's not what I meant, Chan? Chan argued from a big business perspective, corporate food. Terry argued from a food is related to broader socioeconomic cultural issues. But the discussion continues on without stopping because it seems that everyone sort of understands that what this is is a stage in the game where people are taking positions based on the, their ideological strengths to sort of argue how are we going to frame these problems, how are we going to approach them. And that sort of idea gives you a sense of this, of this as a learning context, that this is problem solving in which people are, are, are negotiating their place, um, their place in the game. When in the course of, this, of, their, of their negotiations they, they decide on projects, they decide to participate in a, in a one day event in collaboration with other service learning classes and other local organizations to protest the use of public space. Now notice that public space is a little bit different than food issues, right? The public space idea, they're going to take two parking spaces right downtown and put up a display to show an alternative to that use of public space for parking. Okay? And then they're going to take up, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to facilitate an activist networking session later in the year. And so what happens is they decide to write. They decide to make an argument that links the demonstration about public space with the organization, with the, with the organizing meeting that's going to happen later on, to try to build up, like to, to create a larger message outside the class of what they're trying to do. Um, just to give you a sense of where we're going to go, I position this work and these, this inquiry as a form of 21st century literacy. And, uh, it's collaborative problem solving in a technology rich environment. Um, we'll talk about um, problems that, that this approach raises in just a moment. Just to draw your attention to the College of Career Readiness Anchor Standard number six, it says students use technology, including the internet, to produce and publish writing. 
to interact and collaborate with others. They need to be able to use technology strategically when creating, refining, and collaborating on writing. Um, and I see those. I see that standard as as really linked up quite nicely with with NCTE's definition of 21st century literacy. Uh, but what what's interesting to me about both the common core about the common core requirements and NCTE's, defi NCTE's definition is that there's a lot of uh, a lot of different kinds of learning that we're talking about here. You can look at the underlying underlying text to see how see how just how different those those kinds of learning are. So that's where I started my problem my problem statement that that 21st century literacy is really talking about a very complex set of uh, very complex kind of learning. Um, and that crisis narratives are being used to push that kind of learning on us. Okay, and I want you to know that I'm not here talking about 21st century literacy in the, in a crisis kind of way. Say, if we don't do this, our students won't be able to compete against whatever you fill in the blanks. Is it Russia now? Is it China now? Who's who's the bad guy that we need to be able to compete against? Um, uh, the uh, the other problem the other problem though is this uh, is this sense of the black of the black box. So I'm trying to get a timer here. My phone's going out. Um, is this problem of the black box? Anybody right familiar with the concept of a black box? Mm -hmm. We know about it in, in airplanes, right? The black box recorder. But also think about the black box, the, the thing on your TV that magically takes signals in and produces things. And in electronics, black boxes are things that we, they, do, they do a function, but we don't necessarily know what that function is. Something comes in, something comes out. I want to represent 21st century literacy and other aspects of uh, democratized education as sometimes being treated in the, research, in the literature as being a black box. We know it's good. Things come in and good good things come out, but we don't exactly know what the things are inside them. So the goal today is to talk about what's inside the black box when we put together collaborative learning and literacy media to problem solving. Uh, recent findings by uh, Allison White at Auburn show that high levels of interaction in class produce better revising of student work. And I just want to ask, what's inside those higher levels? What's what makes a level high, and what's you know what's good about a high level? What can be bad about it? The purpose, of course, is to understand the influence of this literacy on group listening, on group learning by listening and looking closely at students working together to solve their problems with the goal of extending the capabilities of the group. Um, two important bits of that is that is that writing, I don't I think, mustn't be separated from the socio-rhetorical context in which ideas about writing and strategies for writing develop. And the, one of the questions is like, what do, what do we think of as the time frame for that socio-rhetorical context? How deep does it go? How far back into in the time frame of a class is the is the socio-rhetorical context for writing? And then to, to take up this notion of, of what do we do when we collaborate? Do we pool our resources? Or do we struggle over who gets to hold the hose in the pool? <laughs> right? Um, in the in, in literature about 21st century literacy, it, it tends to gloss over the pooling. Um, and and not always to con not always consider the struggling so much. Alex said about the class, not everyone has the same experiences. We've come together in this article that we wrote, built consensus, not just to state what we feel, but also to learn by taking each other's viewpoints on. It came together, what we all offer to a common thing. He said, to educate one another. I thought that was a really interesting choice of word, to throw the word educate in there um, in the class. So here's where we are. We have brought up the idea of, of 21st century literacy in the black box and the, the, the goal of seeing collaboration and literacy together. Um, and now we'll look at, at, um, at the questions that I've, that I've developed for this study of, of concept development. And then we'll talk about the theoretical framework. <clears throat> so the questions, uh, these are drawn off of ethnography and communication model. Uh, what were the communicative characteristics that developed among members of the service learning program that enabled this joint production of writing, right? So, so not so much the writing itself, but what, once the writing happened, that then, that then draws, draw, draws the processes that led up to it into focus, okay? So the talk that led to the thinking that led to the writing. Um, and within that, how do the group interactions index conditions for concept development? And then more broadly, how did 21st century literacy then shape that collaborative learning process? Theoretically, I, I rely on Vygotsky and uh, Vygotsky's notion that was worked out further by Jim Orich, that language is the mediator of, of concept development, that we, that we use language to to ascend the rungs, so to speak, of, of conceptual understanding of topics, that our understanding of language changes with use. Um, but then also that literacies are marked, that they that they tell us about where they came from, that they that, that when we speak indexes sources and ideologies and, and uh, social context, 
that literacies are different. Jean Bartin, um, literacy is social practice from, from Barton and Hamilton. Uh, that, that literacy can't be separated, it's not an autonomous practice, um, it's just a way of seeing what's inside people's brains. Um, but it's always, it's always part of social action, always part of doing something. Uh, and, then, and then lastly, Louis Althusser Sayer's notion that, that, the, that language is also the, the means by which people take on, take on ideology, uh, the recognition of, of apparatuses in social institutions of the media, the state, the family, religion, etc. of doing that. Uh, all of these things, you, you might use um, Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. It might be a familiar model to some of you. Um, you could use, you could use the, the zone of proximal development to talk about all these things. That, that language is the mediator. The language is how, is how this, this help from a more skilled peer may very well, may very well take place. That, um, that, the, that the language that will be used or involves a negotiation between the members to see how uh, to see whether there's whether there's sufficient fit between the, 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 the sh if there's shared literacy in order to be able to complete these tasks uh, and so forth and so on and then lastly this idea of the ideology that as as an assistance relationship is formed there's the there's the possibility that that and as that, you know, that language becomes the mediator for for uh, for providing a subject of position for the uh, for the person who's being assisted. Uh, methodologically, as I mentioned, I, draw, I use uh, Himes and others' uh, notions of the ethnography of communication, which is a method of, of identifying uh, the salient features of a communicative situation. And so it starts there with the, with the situation, the context in which talk takes place, the purposes of it. Um, and then the, 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 the events that are the key features of that. You might think of if you've if ever been to a, to a church service, the, the things on the church program sort of like outline the speech events, the different kinds of talk that take place in each one, and then the speech acts inside those speech events. What are the you know what are the speech acts? What patterns um, are, are alive there? Um, within that, the categories of those speech acts. What sort of shape do they take? What kind of genres? What histories do they access? Um, what discourses do they take up? Um, and then you, you, all these things are useful for helping see how well are these communicative resources di distributed in a group. Uh, and Andre's quote helps illustrate this, I think, quite nicely. He says in the midst of the writing, or right afterwards, people were saying stuff. I didn't know, I didn't know what I wanted to say. But it's interesting to me that he framed it in terms of saving, right? I felt like this was an opportunity to contribute verbally to a writing process, but I didn't know, didn't know how to do it. Uh, the context and participants of um, of the study, it's in a large university setting. This is not a middle school or high school classroom. I think it's important to keep that in mind as you look at these at these data excerpts. It's a service learning program, so there's a component of experiential education scaffolded by um, typical academic readings and discussion. As part of a, a three-year study, it's not a longitudinal study except of the teachers teaching it. The students are you know only take it for one or one or more semesters, but I study them as as pods. Uh, it, it's, there were 15 participants in this one semester when I did it, and it doesn't actually, just, the, the data that I coded only includes the time leading up to the writing. I want to stress that. It's, that's the, the reason for taking that, that time frame. So it wound up being about two-thirds of the semester that I coded. Uh, the instructor of the class, his name was Dylan, he said uh, he, he can learn a bit about the class by reading his quote there. And I'll just draw out his quotation in the middle of it, where he said to his colleague and to students, we don't want to make all the decisions. But gosh, this is our job. We don't just want to shoot the breeze. So we have some structure, but we also wanted to have some degree of ownership to level the playing field. So you see a bit of the ethos of the class, this goal, the, the democratic goal of positioning students as authentic decision makers in. The data I used were audio recordings of those 10 weeks of conversations, two class meetings per week for 12 weeks, August through October. The, the, I made written transcripts of those data and then used Atlas TI qualitative coding software to, to identify the salient bits as I mentioned in the methodology which I'll, which I'll talk about a bit more in a second. Uh, supplementarily though I used interview data. I uh, conducted uh, nine interviews so nine of the fifteen were, were given gave 90 minute to two hour long introductory interviews so I could get a sense of the positions that they were likely to take up given what I knew would probably be topics in the course. 
Uh, also, publicity and current events surrounding the class and surrounding the, the issues that they were talking about were quite important. And then their debriefing, which you've seen a couple of quotes from the debriefing, where in the class they talked about what they've done. Uh, how I did it, I, I coded the positionalities that people took up. If they, if, they, if they came at a topic from an environmentalist perspective, I coded it as, them, as it being environmentalist. If they took a, a, a more economic approach, I coded it as such. So when people, when people differed on them, my codes reflect the difference, the different positions that they adopted. Um, I also coded the communicative events that took place and, and de determined what sorts of, like again on a church program, what were the communicative events that happened in the class or introductions of discussion um, and different things. I'll, I'll say a bit of that for the finals. Um, and then I also, coded, I also coded patterns. The questions that they ask, I think I've got some pictures here. So this is the example of the uh, uh, in Alex's statement, a discourse, he's using the idea of biodiversity. And Aaron, in response, if you look at Aaron's response, you see it's really qualitatively different. He's talking about a different thing. He's talking about representation, the way, the way ideas are represented and the, the ideology that's associated with those representations. So the next I, um, I noted the, the kind of speaking that it was, this, the problem posing, interesting that a student was doing it rather than a teacher. So I paid yeah, pay attention to that. And then Alex's was framed in the, the quote that I cut this out of was part of a larger personal narrative about his relationship with his father regarding a debate on biodiversity. And then this appraisal of by Aaron of Alex's statement to say, I was interested in what you said. I think you're missing the larger point. You see what you said to me? The appraisal is quite important. And to ask whether that appraisal was continuous, meaning, yeah, I see where you're going, maybe you should look at this in more divergent in the sense of there's another framework that I think is a stronger one. But begin back on that pooling versus struggling over communicative resources. So here we are, 21st century literacy. We see it happening. We're, we're, we're battling about uh, ideological positions as we pose and answer problems in an authentic um, context. Uh, we talked about this, this black box idea, we're going inside the black box, the purpose of, of seeing this writing pedagogy writ very broadly, and then the, the, the questions, the theoretical framework of ethnography of communication. And let's talk about limitations of the study. I already mentioned the limitations of the context being a middle school classroom and uh, being a, a university classroom rather than a middle school or high school classroom. Uh, Interesting that the uh, you, you can't talk about this sort of really democratic student-driven stuff without without admitting that we we're all teaching in light of very serious constraints on the way that these things can be can be accomplished in real classrooms. And I want to let you know that that's absolutely something I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. And as I interpret these ideas in my own classroom, I'm doing so with the, with the knowledge that my students have to make very strategic choices about how to use their autonomy always limited to provide students authentic reasons to write, to help students find ways um, to, uh, to, to pursue their own purposes in writing, uh, which, I, which I, believe is, I believe is fundamental, but we have to recognize that it's always taken, takes place in a, in a constrained environment, given, given the ubiquity of, of standards and, and other pressures. Uh, of course, the goal is to draw conceptual, conceptual inferences across these places. I, I put Andre's quote in here. He's the same guy that said, I had no idea what to say. Uh, but I think here you have a sense of, of, of why I think there are quite a, quite a lot of conceptual inferences to draw from a slave like this. He says, the, I don't like writing, period, right? But then it was so much, my mind could not handle it. But the end product was way better than I could have been attempted written. Better than any of us. I gained a lot of respect for the process when I read the final product. Even though I couldn't handle it, I say, wow, well, that really worked. Um, so I think, it's, I think it's valuable in a situation like this to, to look for conceptual emphasis that we might, we might use for the constrained environments in which, in which we teach and which we're training teachers to teach. Um, so here's where we are at this point. Um, and now we want to want to look at the actual the characteristics of that of those communicative situations to find out more about inside that black box of 21st century literacy and collaboration. Everybody with me so far? You guys doing okay? I'm going fast. Uh, this is the best this has gone so far. I should let you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice that real people. 
Um, so what, what was interesting about, about the data is, is, is working out what was the salient communicative event. Um, yeah, I go back to John Goodlad's work and working out what the salient communicative, communicative events were in his study long ago. Um, and the salient communicative event, of course, is what? Teachers talking to students all the time, right? Um, and the role of student, authentic student responses and students talking to each other is really pushed far over in the corner. Um, so I found it interesting, first of all, that, 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 the, that, the, that the key that, that so, much of the, so much of the time was spent and so much of the things happened around uh, extended negotiations. And my definition for extended negotiations were when a group of speakers talked about one or cl closely related two topics from, a, from multiple ideological position perspectives. Um, there were multiple appraisals of each other's speech, and that there was a sense that it was it began and concluded. Right, and that's the that's the key definition of a of a communicative event is that there's a beginning and end, and that something new happens um, in speaking afterwards. Um, additionally, though, the appraisal, or rather, within the extended negotiation, were appraisals and the use of distinct genres that differed from normal conversation, um, and then the appearance of new discourses that were not that were not present in the pre pre interviews and were not present in the in the data up to that point and then altered discourses and also I didn't include here but dead discourses discourses that just died off that were just killed um, important to this this allows you to see how authority is performed how people take up positions of authority and uh, perform it and I was able to see that through the discourses that they used and whether or not they, they were in a position to manipulate the genre, to switch over into an illustration. Who switches into a, to a, a personal narrative? Who tells a tale? As we think of faculty meetings, oh gosh, it's story time. Who has the right to switch into story time um, to illustrate, a, to illustrate a, a point and to draw people persuasively on their side? And then lastly, um, the distribution of supervisory and non-supervisory assistance um, seemed important as a as a finding, looking at the way the, the way these the way these community events take place, uh, Terry's Terry's comment here illustrates some of the, some of these key some of these key factors. She says it's the commodification of food, and if you don't know what that is, don't worry. Neither does Jasmine. If I'm a grocery store and I sell X portion, I don't give a crap about the rest. Just throw it away. Don't even compost it. Enclose it in a plastic bag so that things will never happen to it. And Jasmine says, in an amazing deadpan, trying to be sympathetic, I don't know a lot about it. Not trying to offend. Oh, just try and offend me. And Dylan says, guys, we're talking about this process without saying what it is. But what's interesting, instead of Dylan providing an illustration of commodification of food, four students respond with quite different conceptual illustrations of what commodification of food looks like from each of their ideological perspectives. Okay? Which I think is interesting in terms of the way to think about it, the way the zone of proximal development works when there's multiple possibilities um, for moving forward. So then, how did, how did their negotiations index conditions for concept development? Um, the, the, main, the main way in which I talk about this in my work is the, 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 the predominance of discourses of critical awareness, awareness of rep, uh, representation, recognizing that language is. Has, can be act, can be a form of action, uh, recognizing that uh, school norms are different than than norms outside of school. So this re recognition of uh, the need to be critically aware of the messages that are that are put forth in the media and so forth, and that all of that takes place within the context of strategic communication. Um, and these things were realized through through changes in the patterns of assistance, meaning uh, where. The teacher was initially more responsible for providing explanations of, for instance, commodification of food early in the semester. As time wore on, as we might all hope, students increasingly took the responsibility for providing that from their own perspectives, uh, conceptual, you know, pathways into understanding these ideas. Similarly, the same thing happened with problem posing. Students increasingly took on the role of the problem poser. As these discursive, these extended negotiations took place, students realized, ah, oh, here's the salient question, here's the real question that I want to put out there and have us, have us chew on. And that was evidence of, of mobility. Students moving from, as, as we saw with Jasmine, I don't know anything about it, to taking leadership roles and being able to speak from a discursive standpoint that people can identify. And interestingly, Jasmine is currently employed by the University of Georgia 
as a food reclaimer. She works in the decommodification of food. There are YouTube videos where she is talking this game in an incredible way. In the space of a year, she went from... So it's one of these... I'm always reluctant to make claims about concept development in such a short amount of time. But in a case like this, you know, going beyond the, the reach of the, of, the, of, the, of, this, of the data we're talking about here, there's clear evidence that she's become quite... Um, she's developed a real facility in these, in these ideas. And then ultimately, in the decisions they made in writing, we see their, uh, their, their critical awareness and, um, and strategic communication in deciding how to represent themselves to a, to a different audience, a different audience than the, than the, than the round table itself. Um, so just to, just to give you some, some, some backup and, and talk for a second, this parking day event that they did, this is the demonstration, right? Two parking spaces are going to be taken. In the picture, you see a car flipped upside down, right? Kind of representing, we're, we're, we're turning the tables on, on the use of public space. But keep in mind, discourse of public space was not a big deal in this class. This is a local food hunger, food insecurity class. We talked about 50 million people hungry on the first two class meetings, right? Not about parking spaces. You guys with me there? So what was interesting is that, is that this event came up that had lots of potential, maybe crossover, that the student saw as an opportunity to manipulate, right, to spin toward their goals as a class. You guys, you guys see what I'm talking about there? And I'll, I'll let you see a bit of that. And their, but their ultimate goal was to do this AFANS thing. AFANS stands for Athens Food Activist Networking Session. They had this responsibility to develop real buzz, but then they had this other opportunity here where buzz was sort of being given to them by this national, or rather global, protest. So they wrote an article. It'd be interesting to see what they did with this article to try to bridge these two concepts. The article came out in online and in print, and we'll get into what, what that thing said as a, in relation to their talk in just a second. Here we go, so the, the, this is a bit weird, weird way of looking at this, but the, the, uh, the blue is straight up talk about food issues. <coughs> Sorry, excuse, excuse me. The blue is straight up talk about the protest. The yellow is straight up talk about local food and hunger. And the blue and yellow, guess what? That's where they that's where they employ their strategy to bridge the talk about the playful demonstration about public space to issues of food. Right. So in the in the paragraph in the upper right, they're talking about how public schools as public spaces are sites where hunger is a really crucial issue. In the, in the first paragraph, they're talking about how the use of space has to do with local food and the local economy. In the, third, in the second paragraph, how the use of space could be part of a larger solution for ending hunger. Um, so you can, you can roll your eyes or take a quick nap while we look at this table of the discourses that I used. Um, it, this is the frequency of the discourses used by percentage. So food access and structure was not mentioned a whole lot. But by comparison, school norms and languages action or representation were, were talked about quite a bit. And it's interesting that while there are, other, there are other discourses that were clearly critical and aware of ideology, it's interesting that the top three were critically aware. We're not doing things like they do in school. School positions you to do these kinds of work. We're doing different kinds of work. That media image is clearly representing it in this way. Uh, we, when, when policymakers speak, their words are acts. Okay, so this, this critical awareness about the role of language. Um, but then, so, so prior to public space, as I mentioned, prior, prior to the event, public space had been mentioned only once in class by the teacher. But guess what? Following the event, the phrase was used 40 times. The article referred to it every 90 words. The notion of public space. Where did it come from? We can kind of all tell. Um, on this idea of altered and new discourses, the discourse of social change was 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 altered completely from being a hodgepodge of lots of different ideological perspectives on what social change might mean or should mean. Um, but after the event, it really became social change equals change by changing the way public space is allocated. Uh, the new discourse of momentum really replaced the discourse of spark. And that makes sense if the students perceived that the spark had taken place. They had their impetus, and their writing, rather than being a spark, was to carry forward that momentum. And the, the language of momentum is quite strong, not only in their speaking, but in their writing as well. So, 
how did how did 21st century literacy, how did this collaborative problem solving, this engagement in a media rich environment using technological tools, uh, this struggle over the making meaning and, and juggling multiple streams of information, how did it shape their collaborative learning? Uh, I think the answer in, 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 the sh in a short piece is, is that it provided them new discursive resources and, and with the writing it provided them new modes of action. And I realize that that's a, that may be a different way of looking at writing, but if we go back to like what we really believe foundationally about writing, writing is a new mode of action. It's a technology, it's technologically mediated mode of action. It, it does something if we, if, we, uh, if we look at it that way. Um, so providing students context in which to discover writing as active, writing as, as being, you know, moving the stone, if you will. But, but, it, but it also raises questions about indoctrination and critical thinking. When the students drop their critical discourses in favor of public space discourse, I couldn't help but wonder if they'd been captivated by the buzz. If they'd caught the buzz and lost their sense of more nuanced, critically aware, media literacy kind of stuff. Okay? Some of that is some of that is grist for future study. Um, some of it we can illustrate here. Uh, Terry says, "You know, I think you know, I think it'd be really fun. A band that has a question for people with markers. What are your ideas? Reconceptualize public space in Athens. It could be very specific or general. It could be interactive. It's not just our message, but it would be. And so I ask you." Has she just drunk the Kool-Aid of public space, or has she been positioned? Is she positioning herself as a strategic speaker, recognizing the power of buzz and using it to her own end? And I think I'll get into it in, in some of the implications. I think it's also important that she's jumped scale here. She's not only posing question to the class, you see, she's also posing question to a, what we are. are well, it's at least for her a hypothetical audience, but really a, a fairly real hypothetical audience. It was going to be real a week later, you know what I mean? Um, so here we are. We've, you've gotten this far. Am I doing okay in time? Where, where am I? Yeah, you're fine. Do I have 10 minutes? Yeah. Yes. Sweet. <laughs> this is just going back. <laughs> um, um, so the, the first thing here uh, the, in, the, in the, the implications of my research is that I, I've, I've used Wurch and Vygotsky's notion of zone of proximal development quite a lot. I think, it's a, I think it's a fantastic way of understanding and helping teachers understand how they can move out of a, a, a dyadic relationship of straight uh, explicit instruction, especially position other students as, as peer teachers. But I think we often have assumptions, we have assumptions about ideological uh, unity that I think, are, I, think it, I think may come from working with much younger people, which makes sense given Vygotsky's background. That the ideas of the ideas of, of leading people in zone of proximal development wouldn't take into account multiple ideological positions, right? If you're if it's a mother and a very young child, don't go right. The, the child is going to do it the way I want to because I'm responsible for this child staying on the road, for instance. Um, but in this case, the ideological positions were the very things that were under were under negotiation. Um, so it so it really act, really it raises interesting questions about about this idea of the more skilled peer help. And what we really saw in the data was that the, that the peers were, were fighting over the, the positions from which they could be capable. Okay? So I'd argue that, that in a, a 21st century literacy approach to the ZPD would have to recognize that capability, not just of the person that we're looking at, the, the, the learner, but the capability of the teacher is very much contingent as well. Just as we know, as we, we've all talked about how if we can position students in things that they know about that they're, that they're good at, they can really do a lot more. You draw on the energies. But what this shows is that it's also quite productive to have them negotiate what they're good at and find, perhaps develop new capabilities, new positions from which to teach. Those seem to be incredibly linguistically rich uh, places, that, you know, sites for learning. So, in, in short, this idea of um, the helper's capabilities, the helper's capabilities, are contingent on the definition of task. Jim Wirtz said, for it to be a zone of proximal development, there has to be a definition of the situation. We have to know what the task is that we're working on. But I think my, my study is important in that it shows that the process of defining the situation can be some of the most interesting parts about the ZPD, and that people can be ZPDing their way along <laughs> while the task is absolutely under negotiation. Um, I think in some ways, there were students after the writing process who, who thought, I'm not really sure the writing was the best way of doing this. 
I would have much rather gone in whatever blown up building or something, you know, start a revolution. Um, the, the, the definition process was not over when they decided to rot. It wasn't, it wasn't over when they, you know, even as they, as they did it. There was quite a, bit, quite a few questions out there. The idea here is that problem posing is a very powerful uh, teaching tool um, and that the appeals issued by multiple contingently capable peers as they adjust may open richer possibilities for the ZPD. Um, next, I just want to talk about this idea of buzz. Uh, I think buzz is an interesting idea when it, in terms of the way buzz relates to audiences and positionality. Is your buzz my buzz? Does, is buzz a universal experience? or do, do they, how, do, how do things buzz differently for different people? Um, we've all made decisions based on what was going on in the world in our classrooms, trying to draw on the idea of buzz to motivate our students. This is the, the event itself, which is a very creative text here in which the, the, the students created a kitchen that was made out of plants. The chest of drawers there is full of collard greens, so it's a turf on top of it. Here's the collard greens right here. This is a bed, but it's literally hay bales in between the head and the foot of the bed. Um, and the, the buzz created as, as newspapers picked up the story, as videos were posted on the internet, they interview, interviewed the students making arguments for what this thing was, trying to, trying to, trying to determine what the thing was. And as, as other videos and, and pictures and multimedia presentations of, what, of this event, it created this context for wanting to argue what the thing was and, and, and capitalize on that momentum to move forward and to, to help carry out some of the other, the other, the other group, the group's other, other goals. Uh, so I want to just want to say here that I think I think it may be important for us to think about the way not the, the way buzz works. I think the, what the study shows there's lots of buzz that goes into creating the course. I mean, a recent buzz that Athens had just been promoted to number four on the list of the 101 most poor counties in America with 32 percent urban poverty. Mm. A lot of buzz there. That's that's mm. exciting stuff, right? Um, that should motivate students to take a, take a course by anti-hunger if you care about anything, for, for gosh sakes, you know what I mean? Um, other buzz about um, the global, global hunger statistics skyrocketing. Recently, the buzz about food stamp participation. We all know these, these numbers are shooting up. There's a lot of buzz about this. But, but, but the students said things like, the public can only take so much of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's a very, kind of a critical awareness of what kind of buzz works and what kind of buzz, does, buzz doesn't work. The buzz that worked for these guys, in my mind, was pretty mandy pandy. You know, kind of kind of light buzz, but very local buzz. But it was it was buzz that they had very much participated in, actively themselves. The last is a, is an issue of scale, and scale isn't something we talk about a whole lot in literacy studies. But I think um, in the question of writing, it uh, I think it may, it may be important. There, there may be maybe some implications of the data here um, that students communicated differently based on the scalar dimensions of the problem. Everybody better, you understand what I mean by scale? That when we position the problem at the level of the class, we talk about it in one way, but when we change the scale of the problem to, and we might be more familiar to think about terms of audience, but when the audience changes, the way of talking about the audience changes, the way of talking to the audience changes, our way of, our, uh, our fighting all of a sudden becomes just like brothers and sisters, right? We fight like cats and dogs when we're together, but when somebody else comes in and messes, we have a united front and we articulate a very clear position. Um, so I think it'd be interesting going forward to look, to, look at, to look at questions of scale. And then in the teaching of writing too, one of, my, one of my questions of my data is, how well do their appraisals of each other's speech map onto their choices in writing? When they're, when they're dealing, with, when they're dealing with, the, with, their, with their audience and the possible ways of interpreting their work, how are they managing anticipated appraisals? The imaginary appraisals of their readers, and does that do those appraisals look like the appraisals that they that they've given with each other? Is it is it more of a an abstracted metacognitive understanding of appraisal, or are they actually in a more like drama kind of way playing out what they've practiced um, using sort of the known audience writ large at a at a higher scale? Um, those are the questions that I'm interested in. I hope you've had a chance to to uh, see something that you find interesting as well, or at least to to ask a question. I'll stop right there. Um, uh, one, one last thing on this question of scale. These are, uh, these are the students, this is the, 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 the female participant I mentioned who went on to be employed by the University of Georgia. This is her, uh, this is her with, with one other student from the class. Uh, you may have noticed in that, in that picture of the classroom, the affinity group was almost entirely gender broken up by gender. 
And that was at a point in the semester when this, uh, this food distribution idea that had come up had really hit the skids and struggled. And the males in the class jumped ship. Yeah, hmm. Why? Well, look, look here. This is a year later. These are pictures from a YouTube video mm -hmm. of this is one, two, three, four, five participants in the class. There were only eight female participants in the class. Mm -hmm. Five of the eight are currently involved in this program. Mm -hmm. So not only did they stay in mm -hmm. through the hard part of the class, they stayed in after their after their credit you know, is, is over anyway. So there's some interesting questions there. Yes. Um, but I'll, yes. I'll look forward to your questions. Yeah. Thank you. What are some of those questions that you're thinking of seeing right now because of the continuation after the class? What are your thoughts about that? You, you mean specifically from what you just said in terms of you know you have those five participants that continue on? What's what are your some of your thoughts from that? Well, all along I've been interested in the way courses, the like way service learning in general, and this is for teacher education as well. How do, how, do, how does how do, how do the way we do teacher education how does the way we do teacher education shape long term decisions and perceptions of students? Right. Okay, so this is a context to ask that question because because this is all about perception of needy people. Right. Um, food insecure people, those are you know, uh, sure. people in, in section of housing there in the picture. Um, so the question is, has always been, what are the long term, what are the long -term choices? It's an interesting uh, layer of lens on that question or, or, or filter to say what are, the, what are the gendered aspects of those long term choices. Yes. Yes. And that, you know, that data is just now beginning to, to sort of appear because this it was a question of whether this organization is going to get off the ground, but the organization is received a grant from the National Foundation. Mm -hmm. It's moving forward, and it's just so interesting. I mean, it's a kitchen, for Pete's sake. Does it have to be so obviously a gendered space? I mean, there's lots of questions about this. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but, but this, that, that, that is really just starting to come in. That's new. Yeah. I'm really interested in, um, we talk about buzz a lot. Um, I yeah, want to kind of stop you and just get my notes. I'm, gonna, sure. I'm not going to be able to take much away from you. Sorry, no, please. It's okay. Um, and so I just wanted you to kind of talk about how you define buzz. Are you looking at buzz as discourse that leads to action or discourse as a result of action? Uh, I take I take buzz uh, if we could go, go to like Vygotsky's notion that reading and writing are learnt right. optimally when they're necessary for something. Okay. And then uh, Holland and Lay laid that out as like compelling reasons with a real social context to receive it. Okay. I think buzz has a powerful potential. The way buzz works is in affecting and framing that social context. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you think about, I used to have a wordle that I put in here of, of the definition of buzz, mm -hmm. because you see how much of it is a, it's a social definition. It's not, you know, on one hand it's a sound, mm -hmm. but it's a sound because it's the sound that two people are making, mm -hmm. and I know it's happening, right? And it's in relation, it's in relation to me. So that, that relational, Thing. I think I think that you know, like we, like we've like I'm sort of reconceptualizing the CPD a bit. I'm also reconceptualizing the notion of a social context to receive right to recognize that just as our identities can be quite malleable, so also social context can be quite flexible. Um, I mean, it's happening all the time. People buy books they don't want to read based on based on lots of reading. You know, I mean, like this is the, back that that ideology thing. We, we get we get positioned by the, by these things, but it's interesting. Um, it's something I feel like teachers know about and constantly use, um, but often assume sort of not realizing the politics of, the, of their choice that, that they have, that they can pick what buzz counts. Mm -hmm. Please. Uh, I'll have one. Yeah. Thank you for remembering my name. Uh, I actually have a two-part question and a, and a possible com um, compliment in between. Depends on how you answer the first one. <laughs> Thanks for that. I'm pretty straightforward, guys. I'm just letting you know. Um, I'm fascinated by how you use the notion of complexity, and, and I, I was really attracted to your metaphor of the black box. Mm -hmm. So, is your black box, and this is uh, it's going to be a yes or no question, is your black box all of the um, 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 intricacies? of the inter and the interconnections that go on within a classroom and on a daily basis, or within life, et cetera, et cetera. That's just a yes and no. For this study, I'm really conceptualizing the black box as you know, trying to get at this idea of 21st century literacies. So 
so it, you know, I'm trying to narrow the black box quite a bit to say when you position students to do authentic problem solving together, leading themselves a bit, identifying problems in a technology-rich environment. So, I mean, practically speaking, that would be a classroom. It'd be it'd be their lives in the classroom. But what I mean is, in particular, when we when we when we set them loose to identify their own problems. Let's make it easier. Is that how you complexify by using that black box? I'm trying to figure out how you're using the word complexity. Oh, gotcha. The, the, the black box is the thing that covers complexity. Right. Okay, you pass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding talk. You're actually... <laughs> Outstanding. You're one of, one of the very few I've ever even heard use positionality. And that's so, such refreshing to, to be heard in this department. So let's talk a little bit about if it's okay. This is what I this is what I heard from you, and I want you to please comment on this. We've got this this uh, I was going to use more macabre type of example, but I'll, I'll, I'll do a different kind of example. We've got this um, really rich flan. You know what that is? Flan, flan, yeah, sure flan. Okay, really really rich dessert, and we put it into this black box, and it's still a very extremely rich research, uh, uh, dessert. But then somehow or another in the description of the flan, what do we get? Mm. We get eggs, mm -hmm. flour, milk, what, I, I don't know how to make flour. Sugar, 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 caramel, 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 caramel sugar, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. We get it as separate ingredients. Mm -hmm. That's right. We never, we never really get the whole picture, if you will, which is how I look at the complexity. <laughs> So we got all this rich, uh, rich data that goes in, and man, crap comes out. Mm -hmm. it, it's like it's, it's so denuded of what really goes on. So a crisis occurs. Teachers then try something, and they fall flat on their face mm -hmm. because they, they don't have the richness that goes on, all of the trials and tribulations, et cetera, that, that one learns. So crisis number one, they fall flat on their face. Crisis number two, then a gap is created between members of the academy and classroom teachers, if you will. They don't know what the heck they're talking about. It is that they do. They just never report that 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 whole flan cake and the tasting of it, blah 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 blah, etc. So then policymakers get a hold of this, and now everyone's unprofessional. Which we know is I'm just trying to sum this up. So we know that it's true. I tell you what really impacted me in your presentation is how you approach problem solving. Uh -huh. it, it wasn't just a problem that you threw out there. It was a multiple layer problem in which everyone was able to um, redo the problem in ways that make sense to them. And what to me is attractive about that is that's how we deal in society. So you were able to create a tension, yeah. if you will, between what goes on in the classroom and what goes on in, in society. So can you comment on that at all? Yeah, well, two, two things. Class, don't worry about it. Two things. <laughs> the, the you got my thinking going. I appreciate it. When I, when I start with NCTEs and the, and the common course approach to, to 21st century literacies, it's not because I think that by breaking them up, we can get a get a get a hold of them. In fact, what I really want to do is to say, breaking them up is that's like that's kind of one reification. That's kind of one expression of what this beautiful thing is. And levels of interaction is another one that I think is really inadequate. So so yeah, I want to I want to I want to have the output of this thing. My, my argument of the white box is that the output is beautiful. It's in beautiful. It's beautiful in students' lives already. The issue is, as you say, bringing it in the classroom and not killing it, or not 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 approaching it in such a you know in such a way as to as to open ourselves up to to a net loss in terms of teacher autonomy or whatever. That, that, no, that. writing about it in such a way that kills it. Oh yes, yeah, yes, yeah, me. Um, but so much you know, you mentioned the 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 the, the, the policy the policy level. So much of, of problem solving right now is is orchestrated. And there's a, there's a there's a fundamental there's a fundamental issue. I, you know, it occurred to me I'm so far into this thing on problem solving. Like, do I need to make sure? Is it clear enough in my presentation that I'm not talking about orchestration of problem solving by an outside by an outside force of authority? That's really it's and really that's the that's actually the bedrock of the whole thing. Um, and I think it comes back to work that really does excite me. I just don't think it I just don't think it goes far enough in, in asking how do we operationalize democratic education. Mm -hmm. 
um, not just not just in name, but in terms of but in terms of positioning students to be to be to be, to be motivated. Right. Now, I would um, amen for for one thing, but um, <laughs> it seems to me that. <laughs> the, the, but I mean, I understand, um, you know, addressing the, the issue of 21st century literacy, um, literacy mediated problem solving, um, and the, the attention to 21st century literacies and all, but it seems to me that, that one way of, of framing the study may be really in looking at, at what you do to privilege the spoken language and its role in mm -hmm. thinking and problem solving because that has been so ignored right. in, um, in teaching and in teacher education and certainly in the whole testing you know, movement because we don't take time to, to even talk about the role of talk in classrooms and in the development of thinking. And, and that has to happen unless you do orchestrate problem solving. So I think that that whole notion, um, the role of, of talk in thinking is not a 21st century idea, but maybe it's bringing it back to the surface of our awareness and our practice mm -hmm. that is you know, something that you can help us. Um, well, that, and that may, that may go back to Alejandro's point that that the, maybe that's where I, I guess that, that I suppose that's where I see the beauty of the flan is in the yeah. is in the conversation, yeah. Yeah. and that that's what preserves it, preserves that richness. Yeah. In looking at the some of the retin comp data on this, there are just so few studies that that look at the talk around yeah. that look at the talk around writing, um, and yet we've got research on collaborative writing that says you know students can do it, they can do it well, they can you know they can they can write capably, they can do better than they would if they were by themselves. We got all these resources that happen in collaboration. Um, but to me, that just that, that points to this the speech events that, that, yeah. that yes. How do they get to that yeah. richness? Yeah. What brings them to that? Yeah. Mike, I have a question about the class itself. How uh, do these students choose to take this class? And the title of the class is uh, Athens Urban Food Collective: The Black okay. Sun. You saw at the beginning. Right. Service learning in geography. Uh, it's a human geography. Human geography, for yeah, those who yeah, don't know, yeah, is an yeah. interdisciplinary yeah. uh, anthrop anthropology, sociology, um, and then kind of hard geography. So, were you an instructor in? At the time, I, I began this study in 2009 as a participant observer. I took the class mm -hmm. in, to initiate my study, um, and then continued on as just a participant observer, but not taking the class. Mm -hmm. And then the last semester was taught. I got to teach it, mm -hmm. um, but that was not 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 what this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just a curiosity, um, how do you know how the groups were formed? The 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 collaborative writing groups. Well, the collaborative writing took, took place in in lots of different ways. It was okay. it was a large, all everybody together. They all skate, which a couple of people said, "Man, that was a killer." And that's what was that's what when Andre said, "I, I can't do this," mm -hmm. it was the all skate. So that was all of them. Right. right, but okay. then there were they, they broke up the article into into pods, and then when, when it edited, um, you mm -hmm. know things mm -hmm. got left on the cutting room floor. Which that itself was a really interesting issue. Right. How people yeah, respond to their writing being dropped out. And in, yeah. in fact, when he said right. when he said it's way better than I could have done myself, mm -hmm. what he said before that statement was, my right my stuff got axed. Well, not all of it. Mm -hmm. And then he goes into this thing. You know what I mean? So. The, so like we, we might be really nervous about hurting students' feelings or something, but man, he would, it was participating in a process that he realized was bigger than himself. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that, that you, you know that things are getting at X because we've got two thousand words in a seven hundred fifty word limit on the article, mm -hmm. and that the way that positions students to, to, to talk about their writing in ways that most of them said they you know, never 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 know. Okay, exactly. so so they went from all down to pods. And they broke into pods. Okay, how did how did they get into pods? Is it random? Is it it was it was a uh, you know like I said they had these small grouping things informally it was like who can be it who can be at the coffee shop at eight thirty we'll have enough you know we're, this group is going to be here it's a very informal but, so, but, so invitations for with time and place and, right okay but what that meant was that it created you know new groupings of people mm -hmm. um, there were there were there were three graduate students in the class mm -hmm. um, and so they they tended to be socially aware not to sort of 
get together and, and let themselves yep. be too much of the driving force behind it. And that just meant that you had these really more experienced riders sitting out there in the coffee shop, kind of informally leading. But in, in one, of the, one of the pods that I followed, because I couldn't beat all the pods hmm. since some of them were meeting uh, simultaneously, was one of the most interesting <laughs> moments in the data was when, was when Hank left because he had to go to a meeting. And this whole like positioning it and people taking authority, who's gonna who's gonna carry the ball here? Right. It was really interesting, and, and, and I almost you know you can almost imagine like when when dad goes away to work or when mom goes off to work and the kids are like, yeah, all right, here we go, we're gonna do this. You know, I don't want I don't want to get I don't want to bring back the group the same thing that we had when when Hank left. You know, mm -hmm. you know to move it forward. So interesting that authority. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out the article that you keep referring to. Was that an assignment that the a, a requirement of the course, or was you know? Because I'm trying to figure out what your operational definition of service learning is, and was the article considered service learning for people, or is well, yeah, well, well where was the re reciprocity with service learning? You know what I'm saying? So, no, absolutely. The the what, what what you have to understand there is that the the reason this turned from a one semester study of a service learning class to a to a four semester study of a service learning class is because the their definition of of um, of writing was absolutely in flux. They had started, right before I began the study, they had all the, their three teachers who teach the, the service learning class, they all had a formal academic paper to come as a result of it, to, to represent the reflective writing, and they all had a straight ahead, like I didn't know people really did this in higher ed, straight ahead um, autonomous model for the writing. Like it was just for them to puke out the information in their head that they had learned. No, no awareness of the writing process at all. As a result of that semester, though, they felt like students' emphasis on the writing was so over the overboard, all anybody cared about was doing well in the writing. In this preconceptual or aconceptual writing pedagogy approach, they dropped all writing at all and went to a went to a very loose, kind of undefined portfolio approach to representing the the, the results of their service learning. Hmm. So when I started the class, the teacher Dylan started with this strong like this is not an academic class, like really pushing back against that the students position themselves as capable students wanting to perform their competence. And you know, tell me what I need to know and tell me how I need to tell you. And the, the, the proof of that is in, hi there, the proof of that is in, is in their journals. I asked for the purposes of my study so that I could see some of that, knowing that if they didn't have it as a class, it was gonna be hard for me to tell it, for them to just to keep an informal reflection journal. Well, guess what they did in the reflection journal? It was like book reports showing that they did the reading. And I have data where one, where one female participant says to another, you know, I have no idea that our journals are going to be due. Are they, you know, next week or something, last week of class? And one said, just make sure that Dylan knows you did the reading. And so there's, you know, the, 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 pretty much the question of, of how, to, how to get students to write, you know, up to the point of the study that I talked about today, um, really a question of how writing could play into a, you know, a, a, a reflection of students learning a thing. And the, it's really the reason I'm talking about this study here is that to me it represents a big leap forward in this teacher's understanding of how to use writing to uh, let students represent what they're learning. How many hours do they do service? The class, it's, uh, the class. It's, it's, not, it's not drawn up that way. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of service learning things have a 20 hour service learning program right. thing. This class kind of starts with the idea that, um, that students are going to are going to find motivation for it. The, the, the teachers is is uses an anarchist framework that says it's an, an affinity based model that says if you don't if you don't want to come, you know that that's great. You might want to come tomorrow, mm -hmm. and and uh, if if you don't want to do what we're doing, tell us why and give us a chance to give us a chance to. So there's, it's a consensus based model, and so that makes it where he's had to negotiate with his administrators, you know, to uh, to deal with that to deal with that lack of requirement in that area. Um, and you mentioned in your discussion that, uh, and I like this idea that writing is a mode of action. Um, and I know in my experience as a teacher that my students in the K-12 setting think that writing is a huge chore and writing, there's no action involved at all. How do you see um, this idea of your service learning and your collaborative writing translate into a, a K-12 setting? Yeah, totally. Well, I think, first of all, you have to decide, like, Teachers are always juggling this tension, recognizing that writing is purposive, mm -hmm. and wanting to provide students an opportunity to, to, to take, take, take it up in that way. 
but then we also have pressures to teach writing as a, as a set of skills. Right. Mm -hmm. um, just because we have to juggle that requirement doesn't mean that doesn't mean that it takes away the, the legitimacy or doesn't mean we can't be honest about looking for ways to teach writing in a way that makes room for students to do so purposefully. Right. Does that make sense? And so, so, so for me in, in, in my classes, I have to think about the way I position students as learners together, like in book clubs or whatever, so that writing becomes a way for them to manifest their learning to the class. Okay. Like, oh gosh, I'm, I'm telling them, well, you guys have really done something great. Oh, we're out of time, and I'm sort of facilitating and putting, I'm putting the kinds of pressures on them that make, well, I suppose if we wrote this up, we could just, you know what I mean? I'm creating right. situations where writing becomes necessary. Mm -hmm. To me, if you, if you, if you, if you, uh, if you neuter all the things that writing does as a technology, I mean, it's a, it's a powerful technology. It puts things, it make, sorry, it makes things, it makes things permanent that we're transient. You know what I mean? If we, if we, if we, if we, if we keep those things in mind, then we can find lots of ways to, to look for really, you know, really practical applications. And it, 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 it comes into how teachers talk to their students about their, about their ideas, I think, I think, but at, at bottom, um, how you draw on their excitement and how you help them respond to the constraints of their environment, hopefully to put, to, to position writing um, and, you know, thoughtful, analytical, creative writing, you know, as being a, a good way of, of taking the next step. Okay. That's a great question. On, on some level, going back to Sissy's comment, I, I saw it too as much more about the oral communication in class, right? That at least your point about the changes in patterns of assistance, right? That, that to me is what you seem to be measuring in your study. Uh, does it have to be filtered through the teacher or students? Are they actually interacting back and forth? Which I, I tend to agree uh, is, you know, is a great concept. But did you actually study how that then translates into the writing? Or did you, or is that a, is that a future um, kind of project for you? Because what I, in terms of your results, what I saw were the students talking with one another and having numerous different ideologies and positions and so forth. Did you then track how that appeared in their writing? Well, okay, so one way, you, you, if you go back, to that, go back to that table and look at the, at the, at the arrival on the scene of some new, some new discourses that are also the same discourses that they take up in the writing. Mm -hmm. and the, the, argument, the argument I'm trying to make is that, that the, this, 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 they've prepared, the developed a way, of talking, a way of talking about these issues together that have you know, maybe gotten them some, some understanding, some critical awareness of these issues but now we have this re this local context, this real situation that we need to respond to. People seem to care about this dumb public space thing. We care about local food, and so so the so the the impetus for writing becomes you know is, is based on is based on the talk, but is manifested in the writing. Is that are we talking about the same thing? I think so. I saw the strategies in the writing, and I liked how you overlaid on the slide um, how they. I think rhetorically, in a sophisticated way, positioned their issue alongside yeah. of the public space. I wonder how that's connected to um, well, back what to you talk. were seeing, what you were seeing in the classroom conversations. What what about that kind of dialogue in the classroom led to them oh, being oh, able okay, to navigate sorry. that? Kind I don't understand of what you're asking. Now I do. So back to the, the data excerpt where, where Terry says. Maybe we could get a banner and with markers and do this stuff. That recognize that re that recognition that there's a scalar jump that's happening in the writing, mm -hmm. that they're um, that they're seeing the, the necessity to speak into a larger a larger place, and that the writing is in a way they're they're it's it is their speaking. I mean, they spoke it out. They literally that much of what the writing was was is transcribed spoken text to a person sitting at the projector with them all, mm -hmm. you know, lobbing in their bomb. <laughs> um, so, but, but that, but that, I don't. I mean, I don't think I've exhausted the the the, the, the tension and the, the complementarity of their speaking and their writing here. I think that, that making the claim that that's important, that that that, that we that keeping those socio rhetorical contexts together, mm -hmm. that that makes sense and that that's a good place to start. I think is my, is my and argument. And does that elevate then their level of discourse in future? Well, see, yeah, and that's and that's my thing. But my question about wanting to see how appraisals show up in in future writing right. is. Uh, it's, you know, in, 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 a, in a more in a more kind of concrete way, can you know do we see patterns of argumentation that are modeled on the writing itself? Right. Um, that is a that is a a level of complexity yeah. beyond what I've currently done in the data, um, but it's but it's right there and, and super and super interesting. I actually um, to me it also in, involves the question. It will help help also answer this question of ideology. 
did students maintain their critical awareness of these issues? Or did they just get caught up in the buzz? Yeah. From, you know, from a ninth grade English teacher classroom, it kind of doesn't matter, they're both cool, you know, they're both great. Um, it's excitement, um, and it worked, and gosh, I'm glad it happened. But, you know, but on a, on a deeper level, that's, a, that's an interesting question to tease out, especially as ide ideology always has issues of power and gender and class and race and stuff, and, and we have to keep in mind that those things are going to, you know, can create uh, issues of oppression that we may be, may be blind to in our excitement that there's buzz. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, you can can go back to you're talking about the the democracy and education issues, and and then you go back and use even like Dewey's kind of question about was it an educative experience? So they want to keep right. learning more and participate right. more, or was it miseducative where it, yeah. it's exciting for a moment, but then it shuts them down from further yeah. learning because mm -hmm. oh well we've done that yeah. let's move on you know and it, it just yeah. it stops the learning. So, the dead end, the rock and compromise. Yeah. Um, okay, we're about, we are out of time. Thank you, George. It was oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. I'll turn you over to Dr. Sharman now. You sure you want to do that? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Once again, y'all, thank you so much. Thank you. Congrats, thank you. Please, folks, job market folks, best of luck. Now, now it's on the place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be right back. So if you want to informally discuss with anyone, please. She's not. Yeah. 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 I, I showed,